In the second part of Module 3, we will investigate hemostasis, another important uh, function of our blood and its carbo. The purpose of this section is to look at hemostasis, which is the process of keeping blood in its liquid state while also preventing excess bleeding. There are a number of multimedia learning units included with this module, so I hope that you will take the time to review these. You'll want to be sure to pause the playback when viewing embedded multimedia. The learning objectives listed on this slide give you a direction as to what you should learn. Pay special attention to the names of diagnostic tests and their purpose and other definitions and terms associated with hemostasis. A simple view of the hemostasis process demonstrates hemostasis in the coagulation factors in a cascade fashion, which you see on the left of this slide. Hemostasis uh, occurs in three phases. There is the primary phase, which involves platelets and blood vessels. The symptoms of defects in primary hemostasis are distinctly different from those involving secondary hemostasis, which is, involves the coagulation factors. The coagulation factors are always present. They're proteins in the blood, and they're circulating in an in inactive form, ready to form a fibrin clot if necessary in essentially this cascade fashion where one acts on another. Uh, physiologically, it, you're going to see a more complicated presentation in an actual um, uh, process. But this is uh, plenty good for learning and understanding a little bit about how coagulation or blood clotting works. And then finally, the third phase uh, requires fibrinolysis or removal of that fibrin clot, which is the last step of, of secondary hemostasis. If you think about it, if the clots don't get removed over a person's lifetime, there would be an awful lot of uh, clots, which are kind of uh, jelly-like fibrinous lumps uh, that would plug the blood vessels and of course it's incompatible with life. People who have excess clotting or thrombotic disorders have to an extent this problem where they make too many clots too easily and they don't get rid of them. So uh, we'll talk about that in a, a little bit. The picture on this slide represents an electron photomicrograph of a blood clot. So the uh, silly string looking part is the fibrin, the end of the clotting process, which pulls together the um, red cells and the white cells and platelets and forms that uh, fibrin or gelatinous mass, which forms a blood clot and allows uh, both bleeding to stop and healing to occur. Pause the playback and click on the picture to view a short video explaining the process of blood clotting. We spoke previously of uh, defects in primary hemostasis and as being demonstrated in mucous membrane, bleeding nose, bleeds, and bruises, or purpura. Purpura uh, are scientifically classified as Bruises. What we see in uh, primary hemostasis defects are immediate bleeding, and again, bleeding in the skin, the nose, the mouth, or the mucous membranes. Secondary hemostasis involves the blood clotting or coagulation factors. And what we see is deep bleeding, bleeding into the joints, the muscles, body cavities, and what you see here is an example of uh, what we would call swelling knee or swollen knee or heme arthrosis. So bleeding into the joints. It's interesting to know that aspirin ingestion interferes with the ability of platelets to form a blood clot. Aspirin belongs to a class of medications called non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or NSAIDs. 
Other examples of these are ibuprofen and naproxen. They're widely used for treating fever pain and inflammatory conditions. Aspirin chemically is known as acetylsalicylic acid and is often abbreviated as ASA. Aspirin has an important effect on platelets. This antiplatelet effect is used to prevent blood clot formation inside the arteries, particularly in individuals who have atherosclerosis or narrowing of blood vessels or are otherwise prone to developing blood clots in their arteries. So these would be people who have had heart attacks, strokes, or um, people who have had procedures related to their uh, coronary blood arteries. What happens is that the Aspirin interferes with platelet aggregation and they can't stick together. If the platelets can't stick together, they can't form a blood clot. This is an irreversible effect. It can take seven to 10 days to completely replace platelets. And too much aspirin could result in prolonged bleeding. So the point here is it's very important to know the uh, history of the patient when evaluating platelet function tests since aspirin uh, can be given intentionally to prevent platelet aggregation and may be taken by an individual for some other reason that may impact platelet aggregation. This is a graphical representation called the coagulation cascade. We've seen it previously in this lesson. And it represents the coagulation factors or plasma proteins involved in primary, excuse me, secondary hemostasis and depicts how they interact one after the other from uh, top to bottom to end up with a fibrin clot. The study of hemostasis and secondary hemostasis is quite complex. For our purpose, we need to know that each factor needs to be present, that each factor needs to be acting appropriately so effective and that uh, in any anything that interferes with any of the factors in this cascade from top to bottom will ultimately impact the ability of a fibrin clot to form and an individual may suffer from bleeding. Remember secondary hemostasis defects result in deep bleeding, bleeding into body cavities and joints. Additionally, we might have uh, defects that result in too much clotting. Those anticoagulant factors are not represented on the clotting cascade and are uh, relatively new to us in our understanding of hemostasis. So we um, look for too much bleeding or people who are at risk for too much bleeding by screening uh, primary hemostasis. So that's the platelet count, the prothrombin time or PT, activator partial thromboplastin time, or APTT, and platelet function test. Too much clotting is a different problem, equally important if not more so. So medical imaging is important in screening for too much clotting because we're looking for actual presence of clots in blood vessels. Or with plasma tests that measure uh, defective anti-clotting proteins, so just like we have proteins that circulate to create clots, we have proteins that circulate to Im impede clotting. And these are protein C, activated protein C, and factor V Leiden mutations. We also introduced the concept of acquired versus inherited disease. So acquired disease is something that happens in relation to medication or some other disorder. So the taking of aspirin could cause an acquired uh, platelet defect. And liver disease, where proteins are manufactured, including coagulation factors, could result in an acquired disorder of secondary hemostasis. Inherited disorders are those you are born with. So an example of this is hemophilia, which is a factor deficiency and the individuals with inherited disease either don't make enough coagulation factor proteins or they are defective. So in primary hemostasis, we're testing for the 
quantity of platelets and also how well platelets can stick together to form a blood clot. In tests for hemost secondary hemostasis, we are measuring the activity of the circulating plasma protein coagulation factors. So basically measuring how fast will plasma, patient plasma clot. The activated partial thromboplastin timer, APTT, is measured in seconds. So it's a very quick test. Mostly used to monitor anticoagulant therapy. When people have surgical procedures or other conditions that may cause them to uh, clot, to have their blood clot, or when they're being treated for an existing blood clot, they'll be treated with a drug called an anticoagulant. So it does exactly what it says, prevents coagulation. The most common um, IV or intravenous anticoagulant is heparin. Heparin is usually only given in an acute care hospital setting and is a first line of treatment for those who are at risk of developing a clot. So the activated partial thromboplastin time, APTT, should be increased in time longer, seconds, when a person is receiving anticoagulant therapy. And we use this test to monitor the effectiveness of the dose of heparin. If people have other abnormalities that impact their circulating coagulation factors, such as hemophilia, which is a factor eight deficiency, liver disease, which uh, impacts the ability of the liver to produce all plasma proteins, and of course anticoagulant, anticoagulant therapy, you will see elevations or lengthening of the seconds used to um, count the APTT. So the length of time for the blood to clot is increased. The prothrombin time, or PT test, is one of the most frequently performed uh, screening and diagnostic tests in um, the hemostasis area. The protime, like the APTT, is measured in seconds, and its most frequent use is to monitor anticoagulant therapy. So the longer it takes, the more seconds it takes for a clot to form in the test tube or in the laboratory instrument, the less ability the individual has to form a blood clot. So that's good if a person has had cardiac uh, procedures, a heart attack, if they've had thrombotic disorders, or they're treated with anticoagulant for some other reason. The most common anticoagulants uh, prescribed are um, Coumadin and, uh, or Warfarin. Coumadin and Warfarin are the same thing. And Coumadin, Warfarin, has an interesting history. It was actually discovered in Wisconsin by the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation uh, at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. So that's WARF, W-A-R-F. Um, it was originally identified by um, actually farmers whose cows were dying in the fields and appeared to be bleeding to death. This was in the uh, 40s, 1940s or so. And it was discovered that they were eating rotted clover, which contained dicumeral compounds. So it was learned through research that these dicumeral compounds interfered with vitamin K. Vitamin K is essential for blood clotting and caused the cows to bleed out. They couldn't clot. Well, this was then translated into uh, rodent poison, rat poison, or warfarin. So it's kind of an interesting little connection. And then uh, further researched and developed as a um, medication for individuals who have clotting disorders or a uh, predisposition or tendency to form blood clots. So that is Coumadin. There are new anticoagulants that are recent, probably within the past 10 years, that behave differently than Coumadin. But you will um, should note that many, 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 many people take Coumadin. And if they do well with this medication and can maintain a therapeutic range, uh, it's inexpensive, readily available, well understood 
So it's important to know that medications, uh, when we say well understood, it means that we know how they'll behave and what will happen if a person has an underdose or overdose. Anyway, because so many people take Coumadin, it's important that uh, the results of this test are standardized across the world. And that's where the INR comes from. INR means International Normalized Ratio. It's a calculation. The whole point of the INR is to provide information to the provider that is consistent from state to state and country to country so that they know... The, that the individual they're following has uh, a sufficient amount of Coumadin in their system without having too much. So that was kind of a long story about the history of warfarin and Coumadin and why we use it and why we would definitely want a standard, consistent reporting value regardless of which laboratory uh, performs the test. You should also know that um, the prothrombin time and the INR will be abnormal, elevated, or too long, too many seconds to clot in instances where somebody has a coagulation factor deficiency, so some flaw in that cascade, liver disease, because the coagulation factors are produced in the liver, or vitamin K deficiency, which can happen for many reasons, including nutrition problems. Um, vitamin K is essential for the production of the clotting factors that are measured with the prothrombin time. So uh, in addition to the little bit of the history and why people take Coumadin in the first place, it's important for you to be able to correlate the prothrombin time test with this short list of reasons. This is a summary of the major tests used to screen for excess bleeding. The prothrombin time standardized with the INR calculation used to monitor Coumadin therapy can be prolonged so the number of seconds you determine to, uh, for blood to clot is increased. Prolonged in liver disease, inherited factor deficiencies, vitamin K deficiencies, uh, prothrombin time measures coagulation factors that are linked to vitamin K. This is a screening test with a low positive predictive value in an asymptomatic population. What does that mean? That means that for people without medication history or symptomatic history, an abnormal prothrombin time probably does not point to a coagulation factor disorder in a person who is just being screened. Meaning, we have to look further. If somebody has an abnormal prothrombin time and nothing else contributing to that abnormality. The activated partial thromboplastin time just to review, is used to monitor drug therapy, in this case heparin, can be abnormal in liver disease again, abnormal in inherited factor deficiency such as hemophilia, and is also a screening test with low positive predictive value in the asymptomatic population. What we should take away from this is these are good tests when used for a specific purpose, not very good tests if we're using them to screen uh, people who may be uh, pre-surgical or something else. It doesn't tell us very much, and so we don't do them very often for that purpose anymore. We also have specific clotting factor assays. So the prothrombin time and APTT are what we call global tests. They measure multiple factors at the same time. The clotting factor assays are used to follow up on abnormal global tests, so prothrombin time or APTT. In this case, we're doing testing to mo monitor the activity of specific factors. This is a specific test, and it has a very high positive predictive value. So in other words, if this test is abnormal, we can feel confident that the individual being tested has an abnormality with a specific clotting factor. You can see these clotting factors are named with Roman numerals. 
And it's confusing. They were named as they were discovered and not in their order of importance, which is why the coagulation cascade is hard to learn. It doesn't follow in order. Again, the coagulation factor assays measure activity of individual factors versus the global test prothrombin time, or APTT. Bleeding disorders are not common, but we do know quite a bit about some of them, including hemophilia. Hemophilia is an inherited disorder. It's inherited on the X chromosome, so from the mom, who is a carrier, affects male children because they have no corresponding normal X chromosome from the dad. Uh, and the individuals who have the disease hemophilia are subject to abnormal bleeding into their joints and soft tissues, and they generally do not live a very long life. We would diagnose hemophilia or factor eight deficiency with the patient history so a male child experiencing unusual bleeding, others in the family with similar problems, an increased screening test, the APTT, which measures a whole portion of the clotting cascade, and a factor eight assay. Factor eight is the abnormal coagulation factor. If it's abnormal, the cascade cannot proceed normally and a normal clot can't form. Hemophilia has an interesting historical linkage um, with the Russian Revolution and the Russian royal family. Hemophilia was found in the royal families of Europe through uh, Queen Victoria of England. You can read more about that at this linked story. Hemophilia is also linked to HIV and the safety of blood products in the 1970s and 1980s. There's much documentation about this. You can read a short story of hemophilia, HIV, and the blood supply at this linked uh, story. And these are short. I do encourage you to read them. They uh, enhance your learning and understanding of uh, diseases, the diagnosis of disease, and how diseases and diagnosis of disease can impact uh, world history even. So now we go into a concept of hemostasis gone haywire. This is called disseminated intravascular coagulation, DIC. This is always an acquired disorder and it follows some underlying disease such as sepsis, so blood infections, obstetrics, cancers. It's a life-threatening condition, and it is essentially the failure of the hemostatic mechanism. We call it hyperfibrinolytic. So if we know that fibrinolysis is the process whereby blood clots are broken down, so there aren't too many, a hyper situation of that would mean that too many blood clots are broken down. So essentially what happens is the body is trying to produce blood clots uh, in response to some condition. And, and while the body is trying to produce blood clots, they're being rapidly destroyed. So it's a constant vicious cycle of trying to produce blood clots, the blood clots being destroyed, blood clotting factors and platelets are used up and the patient is bleeding to death. Um, how do we diagnose DIC? So history, remember it's acquired from something uh, related to something else. Symptoms, so uh, strange bleeding, bleeding from incisions, um, unusual bleeding from uh, body cavities. The platelet count will be decreased, platelets are being used up. The APTT will be increased, coagulation factors are being used up Fibrinogen will be decreased, a coagulation factor, it's being used up. And then we also see an increase in something called fibrin split products. So this is a hyperfibrinolytic disorder. Blood clots are being rapidly destroyed. The byproducts of that clot lysis are fibrin split products. Everybody always has some because your body is always adjusting, bleeding, and clotting. However, when we start to be able to measure these, so the amount increases beyond a certain low level, we can start to suspect 
DIC. And of course, all of the other things will play into that, uh, including history symptoms and so forth. You should recognize DIC as pretty much a complete failure of the coagulation process and a very life-threatening disorder. Let's move now to the concept of thrombosis. So thrombosis is the uh, idea of too many blood clot, uh, too many blood clots are, or the tendency to form blood clots. This is more common than bleeding disorders. So what we say is an individual has a hereditary deficiency or a hypercoagulability. Sneakers and Remember street from fashion the earlier hand slide, hand we Japan talked about no the anti-coagulation circulating blood factors. West, so Japan when those aren't working properly or they're deficient, an individual so has a tendency to those. form your boy Reggie blood Casual clots. And today on this state, it could also be an acquired condition due to lifestyle. So Japan. lifestyle examples would be um, overweight, sedentary, cigarette smoking, and some other factors that contribute to a uh, tendency to form blood clots. There are two terms related to this, a uh, DVT, which is a deep vein thrombosis, and a PE, or a pulmonary embolism. A pulmonary embolism is a deep vein thrombosis that has traveled to the lungs, and it is a life-threatening condition. Diagnosis of thrombosis includes history, uh, sonogram, arteriograms, and venograms, so a diagnostic imaging test, a D-dimer test, a D-dimer test is, is a test is for no um, the fibrin split Japan. products no or the blood products to stop its clotting. So if there is a blood clot, the body will be trying to on the remove that clot, and the D-dimer, so by products of clotting, should be elevated. In their closet. This test has a high Hence, negative predictive value. With nearly that tells you that if this test is negative, there's a very strong likelihood much of that the symptoms that the person is experiencing are not related to a blood clot. In Japan. And we can also long-term measure the, the actual circulating antiquagulants, protein C, protein S, factor 5, Leiden. Those are all them so natural antiquagulants. That's the graphic is uh, killer legs is telling us that it has uh, no some places, people form it's easy to take blood clots in their legs no or deep vein thrombosis, I mean, the either naturally or due to country. inactivity. Only slightly less annoying and this than is a pharmaceutical company to shoes that is every recommending a treatment off. for so that. The pump a traveling deep vein thrombosis becomes a pulmonary embolism and it can be rapidly fatal. That's probably why they're popular. So there's we plenty sometimes more, hear about people that we just on did long not talk about. airline and flights we'll talk and fairly cramped spaces and uh, different conditions, dehydration, and so on and so forth. And this is true. So individuals who have a tendency to form blood clots do need to be aware of long periods of inactivity, such as might be experienced on an airplane. And um, the killer legs graphic is, is uh, trying to describe that a little bit. Here's a summary of primary and secondary hemostasis. What is happening in these uh, areas and what happens if there's a dysfunction and the tests used to measure. You should be aware of how the um, basically four or five tests that we talked about work, where they work, and the kinds of uh, disorders they can measure and also the drug therapies that they measure. Thrombophilia, again, the tendency to form Tech blood clots. is one of the most alluring styles you should know in street fashion. A little bit recent about years has become more uh, how popular blood due clots to its proclivity or thrombophilia is towards diagnosed. military and athletic subsets. Both what which a deep vein thrombosis or a pulmonary embolism is. Else. And then you should also understand about disseminated intravascular coagulation and what is essentially happening, happening there. Extremely good security.
Go ahead and check up. You will want to complete the quiz for this module before moving on to the next content area. And also, as always, be sure to consult the acronym learning management system course module or the syllabus for guidance on assignment or participation in this section. And that will direct you regarding any discussion that you should participate in or any assignment that you need to complete.